Patrick's ready. Go whenever you're ready. Okay. Hello, all. Thank you so much for attending this edition of the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives uh, 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. Today, I'm honored to introduce Michael Parker. Michael is the author of three collections of short stories and eight novels, including Hello Down There and I Am the Light of This World, coming in November 2022. His short fiction and nonfiction have appeared in numerous publications, including the Georgia Review, the Southwest Review, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. He has received fellowships in fiction from the North Carolina Arts Council and the National Endowment of the Arts, as well as the Hobson Award for Arts and Letters, the North Carolina Award for Literature, and the 2020 Thomas Wolfe Prize. He is a three-time winner of the O. Henry Award for Short Fiction. For nearly 30 years, Michael taught in the MFA Writing Program at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and he has been on the faculty of the Warren Wilson Program for Writers since 20, um, I'm sorry, since 2009. So please help me welcome Michael Parker to speak on Black Winging It in the Digital Age. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kathleen, and a huge thanks to all of you out there in Zoom land for giving up part of your day to tune in. And special thanks to everyone at Special Collections and University Archives, both for asking me to participate in this series and for all the valiant work you have done over these last 50 years and also happy birthday. My relationship with Special Collections dates back to my earliest years at UNCG in the mid 1990s. Then director Emmy Mills was gracious enough to allow me to put together an exhibit showcasing the work of past visiting writers to the creative writing program, as well as work of our distinguished alumni. I confess I stole this idea from an exhibit I visited while a graduate student at the University of Virginia. The curators of that exhibit put together a nifty pamphlet, which I held onto as is my want. If you need proof of my hoarding tendencies, just ask anyone in special collections who has had to deal with my papers. <laughs> when I came to UNCG, I quickly realized that our writing program had a far richer history than my alma mater. So with the help of Emmy Mills and the staff of Special Collections, many graduate students, and the late Jim Clark, we put together the exhibit and a companion pamphlet. Of course, this enterprise was a lot more difficult than I thought. What was I thinking? That it was a matter of putting some books and papers in display cases and opening a few bottles of wine? Special collection staff worked tirelessly and without complaint, though I'm sure that they too were asking each other, what was this guy thinking? The exhibit turned out to be one of the highlights of my nearly three decades at UNCG. We held an event in the Jarrell Lecture Hall featuring a panel discussion on the history of the program with current and formal fa former faculty and a few alumni. And the pamphlet turned out to be an invaluable asset when recruiting students by introducing them to the history of, to my mind, one of the top five writing programs in the country then and now. Maybe it's the uh, top three, let's say, top three. A, dec a decade or so later, when the library graciously agreed to house my papers, I worked with former special collection staff member Janice Holder in an attempt to organize the material. I began writing seriously in my early 20s, and I had kept everything, every notebook, every draft. By kept, I mean I had tossed everything into boxes. It was, as we say in Eastern North Carolina, right much a mess. Janice was extraordinarily patient and an all around good sport, especially when we came across notes and sometimes entire passages written on the back of Duke power bills. And a few times on those barf bags found in the seat back pockets on airplanes. The Duke power bills did not bother me since most of them had been paid. As to the barf bags, I often ran out of paper and these bags were handy and they were free. But there was another bonus. If you want to silence a chatty seatmate when you're not in the mood to spend an entire flight engaging in small talk, 
I suggest you pull out a barf bag and start scribbling. Given my great respect for the work of special collections, my daughter's choice to become an archivist thrilled me no end. I would never tell her this, being of the opinion that you should not discourage your children's choices, nor should you laud them, for it suggests you would not, been, not have been as happy if they had chosen to fight fires. The things that you celebrate in your children the most are the things that do not come from you. My daughter loves museums. I visited her apartment once when she was an undergraduate. On her refrigerator, she had a list of all the museums she had visited. They numbered in the high 60s. I think she was 21 then. At her age, I had been to exactly two museums, the Natural History Museum in Raleigh, where I bypassed the taxidermied owls to spend an hour staring at the python, and the North Carolina Museum of Art, both were on field trips, which, at least for me, were not unlike court-ordered community service. In the years since, my interest in museums has increased. One hot August afternoon in Florence, Italy, I found the air conditioning and the Uffizi to my liking. I have often had the urge to talk to my daughter about the way archives have changed in the age of email and high technology. But I resist this urge since I am forever calling her for advice about how to fix my telephone. My inability to adapt to technology, which is and is not the ostensible topic here, is, I realize, annoying to many. Aren't you a little young to complain about the disappearance of a landline? A friend asked me recently. I stopped short of telling him that you are never too young to act old. To impress him, I could have told him that I remember when I was first allowed to talk to my friends on the phone, discovering that we had a party line. It seems in retrospect, a wonderful thing for a budding writer, since a good deal of the job involves eavesdropping. But along came cell phones, making eavesdropping on phone calls far less fruitful and enjoyable. Of course, the difference is that opposed to, as opposed to neighbors gossiping on a party line while you listen in undetected, the people speaking loudly on cell phones know that they have an audience. If this is the case, I have often wondered, why don't they say something more interesting? Excuse me. When I retired from UNCG, Special Collections generously mounted an exhibit from my papers. During the reception, I clung to the cheese and fruit table in the hallway, worried that I would be embarrassed at the sight of my so often futile labor, but not taking a look was unacceptable given the trouble they had gone to. I ventured in slowly. I was surprised and very moved at the sight of my old Mr. T notebook as well as the tiny pads festooned with stick-on letters I had stolen from my daughter. Noticeably absent were bark bags and power bills, further proof that Patrick Dollar is a saint. As I write these remarks, I am fresh from a 24-hour drive from Austin, Texas to Livingston, Montana. I have made this drive at least 12 times over the years. The first time I drove from Texas to Montana, I took Interstate 20 across Texas to Interstate 25 in Colorado. Navigating the ring roads of Denver in a downpour cured me of that route. One thinks interstates are faster, and it's true that there are no stoplights, but in the case of the state where I have relocated, it still takes a day to get out of it, whether you're on the interstate or not. Say what you want about Texas. And there is plenty to say these days, most of it negative, but its immensity is impressive. I discovered that I could drive from Austin to Western Nebraska taking one road. Forever favoring the analog over the digital, I discovered this not from the chipper lady inside my phone who tells me where to turn, but from my map of the United States of America. 
I have had that map for many years. In Sharpie have I tracked all my drives. If this map were an article of clothing, it would be, as my mother used to say about the ragged t-shirts and jeans with blown out knees I favored in the 1970s, about ready for the rag bag. The creases in its folds are reinforced with Scott's tape. I handle it as if it were the Magna Carta. To get to the Texas Panhandle from Austin, you cross north of Abilene and east of Lubbock, a vast stretch of nothingness called the Big Empty. 150 miles of mesquite, dirt, cactus, rattlesnakes, javelinas, tarantulas, the occasional towns are tiny and consist mostly of abandoned storefronts. I confess on my first encounters, I found the big empty both terrifying and tedious, but I have come to appreciate its beauty as I have trained myself over many trips to study it slowly. Beyond the big empty, my route takes me through the Texas Panhandle, Western Kansas and Western Nebraska. Not far from the Kansas line, trees disappear, replaced by the amber waving plains rightly named Great. That sounds boring, people often say when I tell them about, about my route. Most people think of Kansas and Nebraska as uniformly flat and rural. It is certainly rural and most of it is flat. Though the farther north you get, the more the land undulates until it breaks just south of Alliance, Nebraska, into dramatic butte and gully. Lest you think I'm about to waste your time discussing which roads to take, a habit that afflicts men of a certain advanced age, herein my justification for this travelogue. If you want speed, convenience, and an occasional view of big box chain stores on the outskirts of the big city dots the interstate was made to connect, by all means, take the four or five or six lane highway. If you want pockets of loveliness found in fading advertisements for forgotten soft drinks on the chipped brick sides of abandoned storefronts in the shrink shrinking small towns of America, stick to the back roads. And now we arrive finally, you might be thinking, at my tendentious and admittedly arguable analogy. Taking the interstate is to composing on the computer what taking the back roads is to writing by hand. I could easily blame my Luddite preference on my age, for I have often joked badly that I am BC before computers. But I know dozens of writers my age or older who have made the switch. I read plenty of beautiful and accomplished books that I am sure are not written by hand. I am willing to wager that well over 90% of what I read is not written first by hand. And of course, I have tried composing on the computer, though I take issue with this commonly used verb when describing writing by computer. Those of us committed to pencil are said to write by hand. If you do it on a computer, you are a composer. Why can't we pencil pushers wave that baton? My failure to make the switch from pencil to computer might just be a case of user error. Many of my arguments against it have been countered reasonably by my students. The process of revision, I have argued, is a tactile attack and a bloody one. The page is marred by the scratch and suture of crossouts and insertions which sully margin and finally eliminate it, there being no finite margin between the first thought and the final product. Since, as someone who should be getting rich off royalties once said, a poem is never finished, it is just abandoned. But I keep a file in which all my drafts are saved, my students say. Also, composing on a computer makes it a lot easier to move stuff around. Since revision almost always involves moving stuff around, and my method of doing so is to circle a passage on page 32 and write in the margin, move to page 47, 
a move that is not instantaneous as it is on a computer, but delayed to the next handwritten draft or to the typing up stage. I find this point hard to argue with. The most common reason I hear among those who equate writing by hand with hieroglyphs scratched by sharpened rock on the walls of a cave is this. I think faster than I can write. My answer to this might sound harsh, but I include myself when I say that not everything we think is worth writing down. I prefer to write by hand precisely because like the back roads I favor, like the endless big empty, it slows me down in ways that for me foster discovery. But it is also about perfecting rhythm. I am devoted to all manner of prose styles. Lyricism seems to be my natural bent and therefore something I am often trying to avoid for lyricism befits only certain emotional and physical experiences. And the mark of a successful work of fiction to my mind is not uniformity of style, but a syntactical strategy attuned to the dramatic moment at hand. But even the sparest prose calls for rhythmic precision. Try as I have, I just cannot make on the computer a sentence that sings because it has got that swing. Though I once preferred the uniball onyx stick roller ball pen, I now write only with pencils. I remember experiencing pencil envy as early as fourth grade when Marshall Lee unzipped the plastic pouch of his canvas covered three ring binder notebook and pulled out a number two black warrior. My yellow bargain bin pencil bought in bulk for the five of us Parker kids from whatever variety store had spent the most advertising dollars in the latest edition of my father's newspaper seemed as primitive as a twig dipped in ash. Whenever possible, I sat beside Marshall Lee so that I could study that black warrior. Its ride was smooth. Its eraser left no smudges. James Bond would favor one, I decided. And surely because of the Black Warrior, Marshall Lee made all A's. I am now committed entirely to pencils made by the Black Wing Company. I am such a fanboy that I signed up for the Black Wing subscription service, which affords me a quarterly 12 pack of their limited edition treasures. Here's an example. I just got this in the mail. I'm so excited. Previous editions have honored coffee houses and independent bookstores. My favorites include a tribute to the Indian sitar player, Ravi Shankar, and the, and the Woody Guthrie commemorative, inspired by lines from This Land is Your Land, Ribbon of Highway, In the Skyway, etc. Guthrie lived for 10 years after the interstate highway system was created but his songs are synonymous with the back roads of America. I have the feeling that he would be as disgusted as I am by the scratchy, unnuanced ride of the so-called mechanical pencil. Another recent Black Wing special edition honors the work and teaching of artist and educator Coretta Kent, who implored her painting and design students to engage in slow looking exercises to look long and look hard in order to see the world from a fresh perspective. I assure you that I'm not receiving kickbacks from Blackwing Incorporated, but I suspect this copy on the back of the beautiful carton of the latest edition, the golden ratio, might win at least a couple of you over. The golden ratio is a mathematical ratio often found in nature, art, and design. It gives the world around us composition and symmetry that, that for reasons we don't fully understand, we find beautiful. The golden ratio appears in the spiral of a seashell, the uncurling of a fern. It can be heard in the arrangements of Beethoven, Mozart, and Bach. It can be seen in the works of artists and architects from Salvador Dali 
to Frank Lloyd Wright. Okay, first of all, anything that encompasses the hallucinatory surrealism of Dali and the innovatively organic but functional work of Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright has my attention. But the following sentence is a clincher. The golden ratio gives the world around us composition and symmetry that for reasons, reasons we don't fully understand, we find beautiful. I am deeply distrustful of anything approaching a statement of purpose where art is concerned. Though that sentence comes close to nailing my intention and in everything I write, to find a formal means to dice order from chaos while preserving mystery and discovering truth and beauty. As particular as I have been about pen and pencil, I have been far less discriminating about paper, moving from lined Mr. T notebooks to legal pads to computer paper to, for the past few years, sketch pads. Back when I wrote on, wrote on computer paper, I was bewitched by one of those inexplicable writerly superstitions that quality was exemplified by quantity. A good day at the desk depended on how many words I could get on a page. The mark of a bad day was a large and loopy cursive. I can't remember my rationale, but I think it had something to do with my ability to access my subconscious. Likely, it was also influenced by whether or not I had a hangover. I have also experimented with, these soup, with those supersized sketch pads meant to rest on easels. I first made use of these pads in a collaboration I did with my friend and former colleague, Lee Zacharias, for an exhibit at the Weatherspoon. One section of this collaboration became the catalyst for my novel, The Watery Part of the World. I wrote an entire story on one of these pads a couple of years ago. But I only bring out the gigantic sketch pads, I, I bring out the gigantic sketch pad sparingly, since writing on it requires lying on the floor. Years of running marathons has made getting up from the floor an activity for which I must set aside a quarter hour. I am not so deluded to think that discoveries cannot be made when keyboarding, as they call it, but I prefer to get lost by pencil as I do by back road, and whenever possible to navigate by map. There are issues which crop up, whether you travel by interstate or back road. As I ambled north last week, fleeing from the weeks long string of triple digits, in search of the balmier nights of the Northern Plains, I was reminded again that in that snowy, icy Northland, there are two seasons, winter and road construction. Road work occurs on both back road and interstate, and it is akin to what writers call getting stuck. I confess I have never suffered from writer's block, though there are probably some readers who wish that I had. But there is not a writer, dead or alive, who has not gotten stuck. In the Lone Star State, there is a phenomenon known as a Texit. A standstill on the freeway encourages impatient Texans in their huge SUVs and pickups to veer across the shoulder, their big tires bouncing across ditches to a less clogged access road. This maneuver is unnerving and surely illegal, but I wish there was a literary equivalent. On the page, if you're stuck, you're stuck. Though I have found ways to at least attempt to push forward. One practice is to write the sentence proceeding over and over in the manner of an errant schoolboy disciplined by filling the blackboard with a phrase like, I will not talk out of turn. What does it mean that one sentence follows another? The writer Peter Hankey asked. A literary text that does not exist that answers this question. Digital or analog, disembodied voice giving directions from inside a cell phone 
or creased and disintegrating map of America, we are all in the same traffic jam. In this way, method or process matters not at all. And I have been reminded of such many times in many ways. More than once, I have been told that when I begin a sentence with, I don't mean to be prescriptive, what follows is always prescriptive. And yet, I cling to my back roads that allow me to look long and look hard, despite the bemusement of others. The loft in my condo, where I often write, shares a wall with my neighbor. One day, he stopped me by the mailbox and said, do you have like a pencil sharpener mounted on the wall? I confess that I did. Wow, he said, that's old school. After a recent stay with a friend, she admitted that for days after my departure, she was vacuuming pencil shavings. As is generally true in matters of personal hygiene, I rarely smell myself. But when I do, the aroma of pencil does not send me to the shower. It makes me want to make sentences. So off I go, smelling of old school, climbing the stairs to the loft where my ancient crank handled sharpener awaits. I carry with me the tool of my trade. Laptops may grow lighter and more portable by the year, but you will never be able to tuck one behind your ear. Thank you. I have some, um, I have just a few, um, what do you call them? Visual aids. I think we should call them visual aids. So let me bring these up and see if this works. Wait a minute, hold on. See, this is an example of, of, my, <laughs> of my inability to master technology. Let me see what I can do here. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, okay, good. Yes. All right, so this yeah. is good, excellent, thank you. So this is, um, this is an example of the huge pad that Lee Zacharias, uh, my collaboration with Lee Zacharias um, encouraged me to do. Um, although Lee, if, if probably is saying, I didn't encourage you to do that. Um, but this is a whole story that I wrote on, on the sheet, like I said, lying on the floor. And, um, and it's, so that's one page which equaled seven typed pages. So you can get a lot out of it. And as you can see, I write, I write pretty tiny. And um, so I, as I said, I write now with, with sketch pads. And this is an example of, oh, wait, I had, so my, my daughter took a picture of this because I left it at her house in Asheville. And this is um, a, a black wing just to show you the scale, okay? Because she's an archivist, she figures out how to do stuff like this. And this is a, another black wing. Aren't they handsome? They're really handsome. Actually, this is, this is that, and this is a new edition. Can you see that? They're just stunning. Um, and this is a, the, um, the way I write now. And I wanted to show you, I asked Patrick to send me some stuff from, um, from special collections, and he just um, sort of serendipitously sent me these two things. Okay, so the first one is, um, I have a new book coming out uh, in November, and and part of it is set in East Texas, and then the rest of it is set in a town that is based on Astoria, Oregon, which I had been through several times when I lived in Seattle. I was driving back and forth from um, from Astoria. Well, no, excuse me, from Seattle to Portland. It's a beautiful town on the banks of the Columbia River. So I had written this in 1985. And then now, what year is it? 2022, I have written about this town that I first wrote about in 1985, but I don't remember writing this at all. I just thought, oh, I'll write about Astoria because that's a place I remember well. And then I went back um, to Seattle and I drove down to Portland and, and I still was sort of in love with it. Um, and then this, often people ask me how long my first novel took and I never can answer that question because I can't remember, um, you know, I can barely remember the title of it. 
And if you asked me what it was about, I would, I would, I would probably say 250, it's about 250 pages or longer. Um, but this answers the question. So oddly enough, I dated um, everything that I, um, that I wrote then. So December 85 through January. So this tells me that, you know, exactly when I started this book um, and, and some of the notes are not actually from the book, but some of them are. So that's just a testimony to what the archives mean for me. And, and I think for others and that you can go back and look at this stuff and think, oh, wow, I know exactly, you know, when that started. And also, you can go back and look and think, what in the world is that? I have no recollection of having written that. Um, and it's just a, a, it's a wonderful way of sort of tracking what you've done, because otherwise, um, well, I won't get into what happens when you, um, when you completely write on a computer and what that means in terms of looking back um, at, at your previous drafts, because I think that's different. And also I know obviously nothing about it. Um, so I was talking about, you know, people saying uh, it, it's easier to move things around on the computer, which I think is probably true because my way of doing it was to write, as you can see, this is insert A, insert B and insert C. So I would just write on the, on the draft C insert A, and then I would just type this up or, or I often wrote two drafts by hand. And then I would have to write these things in hand. Here's my favorite, my, my Mr. T notebook. Um, I don't know what, you know, uh, caused me to buy a Mr. T notebook, but I love that I did. And I love that that Patrick put it in the exhibit. Um, and, I'm, and I love that he sent it to me. Um, and here's a picture of my map. As you can see, it's it's a little worse for wear. This is the route I take up. You don't want to hear my route. <laughs> Just don't ever do this route because it's all interstate. Here's another here's another picture of uh, that's all Texas, but I don't think I've done. I've been to South Texas. I didn't write it on there. And this hole right here, this is Lubbock. I don't know. Is there? Any, is, I hope there's no one out there from Lubbock, but. I'm just going to go ahead and say you can kind of skip Lubbock. Um, I know Kathleen's from Texas. She might have people from, from there. Anyway, um, let's see. Now, how do I stop my share? All right. That's it. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to attempt to, um, to answer them. Um, Thank you. I wanted to say thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. Um, matter of fact, I want to quote from one of uh, the people who are viewing it today, Sarah Esther, who said that this was just a pleasure to listen to. I thought that just was a um, perfect thing to say. But yes, please, if you are gracious enough to answer questions, we would love that. I'm, I'm happy to. More than happy to. I'm, I'm certainly, and I'm certainly interested in hearing if anyone wants to explain to me and defend writing by computer because I, you know, I know that I'm not too old. Well, am I too old to change the way I write? I mean, maybe, I think I can do it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Can North Carolina Literary Review publish this essay? I mean, if you want, <laughs> I think I'd have to clean it up a little bit. Also, I did. Don't quote me on that Lubbock thing, because you know people do come from Lubbock. And, and Kathleen, do you have any people from Lubbock? I had some friends that went to um, to school in Lubbock, and it was pretty. It was pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. I think it it, it took twelve hours to get from Houston to Lubbock by car. So you might yeah. as well have gone to out of state to school. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I once drove from um, Houston to El Paso, and it took. Some of them, something like 16 or 18 hours. And I, and I was thinking if I drove 16 or 18 hours north from Greensboro, I, I think I might be in Canada you know, or living <laughs> some other country. Um, so do you write letters by hand too? I write postcards by hand and then I, um, I practice. I practice, like I'll write two postcards and I'll write one by hand and then um, and then I rewrite it. Um, I do write that. I mean, I write emails, obviously. I'm like, how else can you do it? But I do write letters by hand. Um, 
and I love I love writing letters by hand and getting letters by hand. Um, Patrick asks, do you find it more difficult to write long fiction or short fiction? Most definitely, I find it more difficult to write short fiction. And I had a book come out a few years ago, um, which was only short stories of the, the longest, I think, was five pages. Most of them were from, you know, maybe a paragraph to two to three pages. And, you know, I think every novice is a failed poet, um, especially me. And I, I was, that was my sort of attempt at, at writing prose poems, but um, it was just too difficult. I have such tremendous respect for poets um, because, you know, I, my mind is just so discursive. And I also feel like the older you get, the more history you have, obviously. So writing short stories just calls for such precision um, and, um, and compression. And I'm not that, I don't think in that way. Um, but I do write short stories. I have some I've been writing, but they're way too long. Um, what is your favorite part of writing on the sketch pads? Do you have a preference in paper or notebook? Also keep trying with the poems, you can do it. Thank you, I'm really encouraged by that. So I have, here's my sketch pad that I write in. And um, what, what's your favorite part? I don't, so they're not lined and there's something very freeing about not having lines. I haven't written on line paper in years and I'm not sure I can articulate why. I think I blame it all on Lee Zacharias. I think she's here, so <laughs> Lee, it's all your fault. Um, it's all your fault that you freed me from, you know, the constraint of lines. And, and I just think it, there's something about having to write in line paper um, or unlined paper uh, that just frees you from a kind of um, constraint of, um, of making sense. I'm not that interested in transitions anymore. I feel like it, the transition should be sort of embedded in the, in the paragraph before and you, you know, you don't need to say the next day, you know, those kinds of things. And there's something about writing a sketchpad that encourages that sort of um, thinking. Um, I don't know, maybe there are other ones. Uh, the golden ratio, I remember this from my classes. You know, I'm really, um, I have to say I didn't know anything about the golden ratio, but when I read that, here's a black wing. This is what you get. Listen, I cannot, I cannot explain to you. I cannot, uh, I cannot articulate how wonderful it is to go down to the mailbox and find a package inside of which are my black wings. It just makes me so happy. Um, and you know, sometimes I run out. I mean, that's the problem with pencils is that they wear down, but I don't really care about that. Um, Lee Zacharias says, I print everything I write on the computer and scribble all over it as special collection knows, for they had the burden of hauling all those drafts away from my studio. I will have to say that, you know, I, when I lived in Greensboro, um, for a long time, I had a, a house with a garage, which I had filled up with drafts. And so I am tremendously thankful for special collections. Um, and I would understand if they ran out of room and had to toss some of those boxes. In. I don't know how many boxes they have, but um, as I said before, it's just a wonderful um, service to writers to be able to go back and look at, um, at their previous drafts. And the idea that anyone looking at that draft might get something out of it is, is also really, um, you know, makes me very happy. Um, Let's see, speaking of Lee, be sure to tune in our, for our speaker series next month to hear a discussion with Lee. I'm there, August 18th. I'm gonna put it inside my telephone. Um, has moving to a new state changed your writing inspirations? At least Smith told me the last time I saw her that I was like Cormac McCarthy, that I was moving further west. And um, cause I had written a book that was set entirely in West Texas. That was all I have in this world. And then um, my last novel, uh, Prairie Fever, was set in Oklahoma and Wyoming. Um, and so I would say that I'm very influenced by the lack of trees in certain parts. 
of Texas and, and the Great Plains and that, because it's so different from the landscape I grew up in, which was, you know, pine forest and, um, and cypress trees and swamp. I grew up in a very swampy part of Eastern North Carolina. Um, Clinton, I'm from Clinton, Sampson County. So um, yeah, I mean, I think landscape is um, so intricately connected to character that um, the character's desires are evoked through descriptions of, descriptions of landscape. And I really don't think you can set a, a story or a novel in a certain landscape um, and, um, and not, you know, not describe that landscape and not evoke emotion through landscape. So it's not sort of an arbitrary decision for me to, to set, um, to set stuff in, in this or that place. Um, it's a very, I think about it a lot. And I, and I, you know, with Oregon, I was a little out of my league because I haven't lived there, but I did live in Seattle and, and also, you know, it just put, put a lot of rain in there and, <laughs> and a lot of mist. And I think we're good. Um, so I, I don't know how much time I have. Um, maybe someone wants to tell me if I, if I'm running out of time. Um, oh, you're, do, you're Patrick doing great says, on time. Yeah. Okay, good. Patrick says, blasphemy. We would never toss any of your collection. I'm so proud to hear that. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you so much. Although I'm sure that, you know, if you want to go through and, and make sure that the um, all the Duke power bills were in fact paid, that would be a great service to me. Although obviously they can't cut off my power um, in Austin. Um, I think you should probably keep the barf bags. Um, and I would really recommend that. I mean, I, 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 the thing I didn't say is that for some strange reason, airports are really inspiring to me in terms of writing. I mean, I can really write anywhere. And um, I'm not a person who needs to write at a desk or, um, or in a particular room with a particular light. I like for it to be quiet. But on the other hand, airports are not quiet. There's always this, um, you know, this loudspeaker saying, you're late for your flight. Um, but I used to go out to the Greensboro Airport, which is not terribly busy out. I'm sure it's changed. Um, and just sit there and work. And, um, and especially on, on airports, I always got a tremendous amount of work done. Um, and I mean, I consider myself a friendly enough guy, um, but I don't, I mean, the idea of getting in a conversation with someone um, when you're taking off and then having to continue that conversation <laughs> for three hours or two hours is, is terrifying to me um, because I don't have that much to say. And um, and one time I was on an airplane. This is the only time this ever happened to me. And the person sitting next to me saw me writing and she, and she said, we were going to Greensboro. So this makes sense. She said, are you the writer Michael Parker? And I said, no, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to say because, it, well, first of all, it's kind of mean, but also it's, you know, it's not that hard to look me up on the end internet or, or see who I am. But I guess I just didn't want to talk to her. And I apologize to her wherever she is. Um, let's see. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I don't know. I think I think this is about it. Um, thank you so much. I've, and it's made me feel like I'm back home again to, to be speaking to y'all. Um, and um, thanks Kathleen and, and thank you Patrick for, for allowing me to speak. Well, thank you again, Michael. And we certainly hope to see you again when you return to campus um, in the next few months. So thank you so much. And lots of thanks in the chat. Um, and thank, thank you to everyone in attendance. Please join us at the next session of our speaker series, which will be a chat with author and educator Lee Zacharias on August 18th. And we'll close now. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you. Sure thing.